So it's a, uh, I'm very excited to welcome uh, Mike McCormack to um, this Irish Studies event. And Mike is going to read from his um, award winning, multiply award winning novel, Solar Bones, and, um, and also from a science fiction project that he's working on. And we'll talk about, um, about his process, about Irish Studies today, and um, about, about his writing, which um, uh, is really um, some of the most interesting writing coming out of Ireland today. Um, so Michael uh, um, won the Rooney Prize for Irish Literature for his first collection of short stories in 1996 called Getting It in the Head, which already involves some kind of science fiction aesthetic. He's also published um, another collection of stories called Forensic Songs and two novels, Crow's Requiem and Notes of Macoma. And Solar Bones came out with Tram Press, um, a great Irish small independent publishing house that has an act for identifying super talented writers who go on to um, great careers. Um, uh, we uh, maybe now you could um, take it away, Mike, and, um, and let us and read a passage from the novel and uh, frame it in whatever way you would like. Okay. Uh, hello, folks, and uh, hello, California. Hello, Berkeley. Um, thank you for the invitation to 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 come and to and to speak to you all and to read and talk and everything like that. I'd be very interested in getting a conversation going and, and uh, I suppose hearing what's on your mind. I always think that these, these readings and talk that they're, they're kind of great for, for um, organizing the furniture in my head. So, uh, so I'd, I'd look forward to, uh, to, to a little bit of that. I'm going to read for uh, Catherine for about, for about half an hour and that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. For about half an hour, and I'm going to, I'm going to split the time equally between. I'm going to split the time, I suppose, equally between uh, my no novel Solar Bones, uh, which Catherine talked about, and my short story, which is published yesterday, uh, which is hot off the press, about as hot off the press as it comes, and it's called uh, "These Are the Tools God Gave Us," and I'll, I'll give a little bit of an introduction to both of them. That story came out in 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 this journal, which is the Stinging Fly Journal, and it was a special edition for Galway, it was supposed to be European City of Culture, and this journal was one of the was one of the journals that was was put together was a journal that was put together for it. So you see, it's a beautiful, beautiful edition. Of that okay. So I'm going to I'm going to read uh, from I'm going to read from Solar Bones, and um, Solar Bones. It's the story of a man who, uh, sometimes when I, I'm asked what Solo Bones is about, and I say it's about, it's about a man who's an engineer and it's about all the other declensions of ma ma masculinity. It's about being a father and being an engineer and being a husband and being a son and being, in, being involved in a community. Um, but in, this, in the particular crisis scene, which comes here, it's about a man who has to step up into himself and become something else, he, something he never anticipated. And it brings him in, in, into an intimacy with his wife that he, again, he never anticipated and uh, he's not at all sure that he welcomes. Um, so this is the, the crucial scene in which he comes, he returns from work one day and he finds, finds that his wife has been ill, has been sick in bed all day. So here we go. That Friday, I came home and I found she'd been sick since morning. Nausea and fever for the first couple of hours, but worsening to cramps and puking in the afternoon. Keeping her in bed with the curtains drawn and a livid flush on her cheeks and a glass of sweat on her face. Her voice a thready rasp of itself whispering. It's been like this all day. I cannot hold anything down. And it was a shock to see her like that, lying there with all the energy twisted out of her. This woman who never took to the bed for any reason whatsoever and do you want me to call the doctor you're burning up as i laid my hand on her forehead which in spite of appearances felt cold beneath the sweaty sheen so no no it's only a bug it'll be gone in the morning all i need is a bit of sleep and you're all right besides the face narrowing into a tight grimace and i've got these cramps that come and go through my stomach i've had them all afternoon and they're not getting any better if I could just get some sleep before her misery came to a head later that evening, 
when I was in the kitchen and I heard her call weekly from the bedroom and I found her leaning over the side of the bed, vomiting a green wash into a basin, her body purging itself in a spasm of spew, a rinse of bitter filth sluicing up out of her as if it were being pumped from someplace deep within her with such twisting force. She was now almost out of the bed, resting her hand on the floor, bracing herself with the basin as she continued to disgorge. Her body now almost head down on the floor in which, after another bout of puking, I finally drew up and settled back within the pillows where she lay trembling and snuffling wetly so. That's it, I said. I'm calling the doctor. No, she rasped, not yet. And the look of pain on her face sank beneath a look of shame and alarm, which lifted up her chin as she said weakly, I need to go to the bathroom and I need you to change these sheets. Okay, I'll throw them in the washing machine. No, no, not the washing machine. Throw them out. And the duvet cover also, she said. Her voice now with an imploring undernote to its breathlessness, which I did not understand, till she glared meaningfully into the middle of the bed. Her shame now burning under a tide of rage, which drew her up with gritted teeth to say, leave the room. You're not able to get out of the room. For Christ's sake, leave the room or you'll regret it, she barked. An outburst which momentarily drained all her strength away pushing her back into the pillows with a heavy gasp as I turned from the room and pulled the door behind me, returning only when I heard the shower running in the bathroom to pick up the sheets, the duvet cover and the nightdress, which was gathered into a tight ball in the middle of the floor where the air was thick, the smell of vomit and that other filth which had been drawn from her body. Now bundled up in these sheets, which I pushed into the wheelie bin outside the back door and then waited with the change of nightdress for her when she stepped out of the shower, which she did after a few minutes, to stand swaying on the tiled floor, heat blushed and dizzy, with steam rising from her pale shoulders as if she were some newborn thing. So I took a towel and dried her off before slipping the nightdress over her head, and then did something I had not done in the longest time. I gathered her up in my arms, and I carried her down the hall to Agnes's room, which was, which was already made up, to sit her on the edge of the bed, where she balanced, breathless and trembling, swaying to one side as I looped the towel around her head and I dried her hair as gently as possible and then ran a brush through it so that when she lay back into the pillows, her face was opened with a fevered heat coming off her in scented waves, gasping, thank you. Her eyes closing as she spoke, all her strength needed to draw the two words up from inside her and I'm ringing the doctor now. This needs to be seen too. Yes. And her exhaustion pushed her off to sleep as I made the phone call to the clinic where the receptionist told me that Marid's GP was on leave. But they put me on to a woman with a quiet telephone manner who requested that I detail clearly all the symptoms and how long they've been in place, all the vomiting and the cramps and the diarrhea and the fever. After which she said she would be at the house in 20 minutes, which indeed she was, and there was a pleasing difference between the calm voice on the phone and the wild haired woman who sat on the side of Moraine's bed, taking her temperature and pulse. A young woman in an oversized Mac with the cuffs rolled up over her wrists and whose face it took me a long moment to recognize, but eventually it came to me. A neighbor's child, one of the Cosgroves of Berrien, who now sat beside Mared running through the steps of her medical examination, pulse, heart, blood pressure, temperature, and drawn off two files of blood from her arm, her hand on her forehead, while Marith held a digital thermometer between her swollen lips, swimming in an ebb and flow of her own fever. The great pulsing throb of her discomfort, which seemed now to envelop her, and into which this young medic now placed her hand and lowered her head to ask, when did you say you went to Agnes's opening? It was two days ago. You had a meal after, yeah? And as she stood up, pulling the stethoscope from around her neck and casting her hair behind her shoulders. So it was a good night. Did you have fun? Yeah, we did. It was a bit of a surprise. And it's been a while since I've seen Agnes. She was a couple of years behind me in school. And you're one of Porrick's girls. Yes, the oldest. I knew the face, but I didn't know which of the Cosgraves you were. There's a few of us all right. How's your father? I see him now and again on the bike. You know, he's great. He's fit and super. Still cycling into town. 
My mother worries about him. He's gone deaf in one ear. So she worries that he ha can't hear things coming behind him. But other than that, he's great. So that's what Agnes is doing now, painting. And her brother, Dara. Yeah, Dara. Oh, we don't know what that lad's at. All we know is that he's in Australia. He's traveling and growing a beard. That's all we know about him. Dara was younger than me. Agnes is the one I remember most. Tell her I said hello. As she turned toward Marion in the bed, who is now lying with her eyes closed, totally oblivious to what we were talking about. And the young doctor laid her hand one final time on her shoulder before getting her to her feet and leaving the room with me following her out to the car on the side of the road, where she threw her bag into the seat with a startlingly swift motion, saying, from what I can see is a case of food poisoning. All the symptoms add up, the fever and the vomit and all the cramps, all the classic symptoms. And if that's the case, then there really isn't nothing you can do about it, but ride it out with her. Give her plenty of water to keep her hydrated. But that is all that really can be done for her. And I'll get these samples off to the lab first thing on Monday. So food poison after two days it can happen. What about the diarrhea? She wouldn't want that. And she shook her head because no, I could prescribe something for that, but I don't want to at this early stage. They might only dehydrate her and that's not what she needs at the moment. I want to give her a few days because the symptoms should abate and she should start to feel better within a day or so. So just keep giving her cool drinks and let her rest. There really isn't a lot more that can be done. I'll call again tomorrow. And she handed me her card with her home number on it and gave me a sympathetic smile once more before she got into the car and she pulled out onto the road. And that was it for the weekend. I was now Morad's carer, ghosting through the house with drinks and clean sheets, mopping her brow and trying to strike the right note of care and compassion at her bedside so that she would feel my presence through her fever, hovering there, willing her to feel my attentiveness, even if she was mostly oblivious to my presence, trembling as she now was within a humid haze, sometimes dozing for hours so that for long periods I had little enough to do except stand beside her bed, looking down on the contours of her body beneath the sheets. While in those short, lucid moments, when she was able to sit up with the pillows at her back, she would only lie there in disbelief, her whole being raw with the sensitivities of what she was going through. This woman who, in all our years together, had never been sick for any length of time, now lying in bed with her pulse slackening to a distant thread, in those moments before she hauled over the side of the bed, racked with such convulsive bouts of spewing, I feared she might be washed from her body completely, bone and soul gone, leaving nothing behind the sheet save dry, lifeless husk, which would serve for kindling. So for the two days of that weekend, I stood by the side of her bed, frequently at a loss as to what I would exactly do. Her face, blast with sweat, skin glowing in the weak light of the bedroom, and something deathly about the way this illness closed her eyes. Leaving her face so unguarded, it allowed me to stare at her and notice for the first time how her avian features, nose and cheekbones converging on some vanishing point ahead of her, had been further refined in her daughter's sharpness. How she had held her looks and her shape into middle age, so that the contours of her body still held close to the figures of the serious girl I'd met over 20 years ago. The girl composed of languages and foreign travel, her body with no fat on it to hinder or weigh it down, and so lightly built for the job of always teetering on the first step of the next journey, always drawing her on. But now this same body was that narrow place in which a fever had taken hold with its purgative heat scouring it from the inside out. I'll leave it that there for a while. Um, yeah, that passage is, is um, it's an important part of the book because uh, um, it comes exactly in, in my copy here, it's, it's 100 to 104 and it lies pretty much at the center of the book and it's the central passage in which he, in which Marcus has to step up out of himself and become a carer uh, something he really has, something he really has no wish to do or anticipation of ever doing. He's he, he's married to to a woman. He's been happily married to a woman who has been blessed with good health and has never really needed his help and who has gone very independently throughout the world. 
and now she in, in a moment of at, at a moment in a moment of generosity and selflessness at at a at a family occasion she sits back and allows her uh, she sits back and allows her, her her husband and daughter to have a conversation and to drink wine and she resolves no I'll stay on water and I'll drink and you two talk away there and that and that kind of does for her because she's the only one drinking water at the table and the water at the table is what gives her this uh, this thing in her stomach is crypt cryptosporidium cryptosporidiosis this terrible this terrible um it's not a viral thing it's a it's a it's it's the other thing uh but it's a it's a terrible uh kind of a an illness and um and that was born out of that particular incident and that part of thematic part of the book was born out of a very real incident here on the west coast of ireland um in about 2008 or 2009 something like that there was an outbreak of uh, our 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 city, which has an ample water supply, and which is one of the wettest cities in the world in some ways, had its water supply contaminated, and um, and that's where that uh, that's where that um, um, uh, incident came from, and that's the central part of the book. The book is about an engineer because um, I've always admired engineers. Um, engineers make the world. Um, those of us who are involved in the humanities literature and poetry we're not happy about that and we resent them for it but um it's the sorry fact of the matter that that is the case even this even this gathering here is by is here by virtue of generations of engineers sitting down and and i i came to that realization very early in my in, in my 20s when through the reading of science fiction through the reading of people like philip k dick and jg ballard and the reading of um, in philosophy of Martin Heidegger's essays on technology. And in my, as I say, in my early 20s, I came to the conviction to the, 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 the rather sorrowful conclusion that engineers make the world. And I always, I always, I think from that moment on, I, sung a, I, I hung a sign out in my imagination that said, engineer wanted. If an engineer shows up here, I will and starts talking to me. I will gladly listen uh, to him, and um, and you know me being who I am, it only took twenty five years for him to show up and start talking to me, because I'm I'm pretty slow at I'm pretty slow at everything I do, but he but he showed up and he started talking, and um, I was very surprised. I was very surprised that that when he did show up as an engineer, that um, he wasn't involved in one of the big kind of heroic or pharaonic enterprises you associate with epic engineering I'm, I'm looking at I'm looking at the at the at the at the bridge behind you Catherine and the, and the, and the tower behind you it's not that's not the sort of engineering he does he's small roads houses little bridges all the kind of small engineering projects that bind villages and all the small secular engineering projects that that bind the world together that came as a surprise to me. I would have thought that me being who I am, and I think if he had presented himself to me in my 20s and 30s, that that's what he would have done. But when he came to me in my 40s, both he and I were tired, and he 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 um, he was involved with these with these smaller projects. So that's kind of segues a small bit into I'll come back to that if, if if it's of any interest to you. Um, that segues a little bit into into I, I, I write the books that come to me whatever they are you know just have this sort of openness to whatever books come to me but i have one deliberate conscious project and that is to see is 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 it is a science fiction is the west of ireland readable and imaginable as a science fiction terrain as a science fiction proposition um and if so is, is an Irish science fiction possible? I, I, I wanted to write a science fiction that wasn't just set in Ireland, but that in some way was an Irish science fiction. Now, I don't know what that is, but I'm trying to write it. When I finished, I'll, I'll come back and maybe, maybe answer, be able to answer the question. So I have this, I have this series of, 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 um, 
I have this series of short stories that are in various stages of completion in that. I, I don't have a, a binding title or a binding conceit for them, but I was, I was, I was asked by the stinging fly to contribute something and, and, and um, I wrote this story and it involves a couple of things that are kind of just touches and one or two thematic things that are, that are unique, not unique to the West of Ireland, but have a home in the West of Ireland and that. This is one of, I'll, I'll read a couple of pages of this piece. These are the tools that God gave us and uh, I'll talk a bit, clarify a little bit uh, about it. And, uh, okay, so these are the tools God gave us. And the upshot of that last job, along with the injuries myself and Welger sustained, was that all my tools were destroyed. All my tools and a full set of gauges badly burned out. And I was sorting through them when Welger swung into the air. How are they, he called, climbing out of the van. Are they bad? The fucked, I said, every one of them. Welger bent down and picked one up. It looked gentle and pliant in his large hand. You could feel the dying warmth of it. He held it to his ear for a moment and then laid it down. We used to, dr we used to drown bags of these in the tide when I was a child, he said. Something in me bristled. These gauges have a full pedigree, I started. The lineal descendants of a German canine. That means nothing to me, Welger said. Beautiful piece of work, I insisted. Why was I going on like this? Welger was looking at me. There's a three-year waiting list for one for a set of these, I added, on a final angry note. Welger stood up. I know a man who can fix them, he said. Throw them in the back of the van, I'll run them over to him. How will I fuck throw them in the back of the van? These gauges are licensed to my name. They have to be a registered lab. They have to go for, to a registered lab for recalibration. So Welder shook his head. If those gauges turn up on someone's workbench and they download the last readings of them, it'll be a long time before you issued with another set. And that's as sure as you're standing there. He was telling the truth and I knew it. And it was a mark of how difficult that last job had been and the extent to which it had scrambled my own sense of the future that I had not foreseen this. And then Welger decided it for me completely. Please yourself, he says, but I guarantee that if you turn those things into a registered lab, you will be out of work for five years. That's how long it'll take for you to get through the screening process and getting you set. They'll know where you've been and what you've been doing, and that'll be the end of it. I made no pretense of mulling it over any longer. I gathered them up and I left them into the back of the van. Welger closed the door on them. That wasn't what brought me over though, he said. I raised my hand. If it's money, it's not money. It's not money, Welger said. Calm down, something else. He put his hand up against the side of the van and he closed his eyes. A dull note of empathy swung through me. I knew exactly what he was feeling. That awful tiredness that washed through my body periodically, leaving it parched and hollow. A flaring trail of fireworks behind the eyes for minutes at a time afterwards, which made concentration so difficult. I've been on tough jobs in my time, Welger continued, but these flashbacks are not like anything I've ever had before. You know, I've been getting them too. A look of relief crossed Welger's face. And I can't tell the time from Adam, he continued. It's all scrambled on me. What time is it now? It's getting on to four o'clock, Welger shook his head. That means nothing to me, he said. You could be telling me anything. I can't tell the time. My sleep is fucked. I know what you're saying, Welger, but there's always a risk on the job. But this is different. It's only been a few days. Give it a couple of weeks, see how it goes. There should be an improvement. Welger's spirit slumped further, a weight visibly sliding through him. A real friend would have been sorry that some of his own anxiety and worried had been soothed by his suffering. But I wasn't, and that's the truth of it. Sound, Welger said heavily, sound. He climbed into the van. I'll drop those gauges off at the man and I'll get back to you when he's had a look at them. There's no rush. He turned out the gate and sped up the coast road. And if you told me then that it would be a couple of months before I'd see him again, I would have been relieved. I gradually improved over the following weeks. The dissonance between my inner clock and the external time slowly meshed as my circadian rhythms fell to their proper hours. And with my sense of time becoming more accurate, my ribs and shoulder began to heal properly, bones knitting together and the bruising in my abdomen clearing also. Day by day, I was harmonizing with myself, returning to my proper being. Three weeks later, I was almost back to myself completely. 
yeah, there was a slight lag in my sleep and in my ability to register time, but I was confident now of myself getting stronger and better. As the days shortened and the winter light closed in around the house, my focus shifted from my own injuries to taking care of my wife. Ellie is a keener, a professional keener. She's one of those women who cry out the praises of the dead, smoothen their passage to heaven and soothe them the souls of the bereaved. Keener by trade, keener by spirit, keener by vocation. Martha, our daughter, says sometimes that she's more comfortable singing the praises of the dead than those of the living. Her most recent contract was a difficult one. It was a male clone in his early 20s whose brutal murder threatened to flare up and incite more violence. Ellie was standing at the gable with a mug of coffee in her hand. Our plot of land ran down to the main road, ran from the main road down to the foreshore in the distance. December clouds piled overhead and she stood raw and windblown, perfectly cut out for this time and place. She looked tired also. You could see the fatigue in her face, the blue shadow beneath her features. I'd seen this before, but there was a malignant depth to this that was new. Winter's here, I said, it's coming early. I'm glad, I like winter. Ellie pulled her cardigan around her and turned her shoulder to the wind. The time of year for rest and sharpening our tools, getting ready for the spring. She raised her hand to her face, to my face. You look better. I'm okay, I'm not so sore now. I got paid also, so that's good. Yes, I got paid too, came through last night. Two checks will carry us till spring, hopefully. I saw the footage you did, I said. Yeah, I hope so. It looks, it looked difficult. You must be tired. I am tired. I'm very tired. It took me an age to get my head around it. You literally don't know what note to strike. There's always that dissonance around clones, even when they're dead. And it leaves you drained. I hate that you have to go off in the dark like that. No idea where you're going. It was the other side of the county. It took two and a half days making sure I crossed no major roads. But I thought you were following me. You were supposed to be following me. I was, but the GPS was twitchy. You disappear for hours at a time and then pop back into focus. It was hard to keep track. Ellie leaned against the wall with her eyes closed. Weak light lit up the shadows crawling beneath her skin. It would take weeks for her face to clear. I now know why so many keeners avoid doing clones. It's so grueling. Some of them never recovered their proper pitch afterwards. And she smiled, but I got a nice note from the mother. She was pleased with my work. It says something good about her that she took the time to write to me. She looked heartbroken in the footage I saw. Who wouldn't be? Her only child just setting out in life and then dying like that. Later that same evening, we set a small fire in the bottom of the garden and burned all the clothes she had used in that last keen. The dress she had walked over a hundred kilometers in, the jacket, her underwear and socks, her old boots. We piled them up, doused them in petrol, then struck a match. The night closed in around us as we watched them burn and as the last flames were dying down, Ellie used a spade to turn the charred remnants into the heart of the fire, ensuring there was nothing left but ashes, the last part of the keening ritual now fulfilled. As we raked the ashes into a pile, Martha came from the house, stripping her head cam as she walked. She came up behind Ellie and put her arms around her, burying her face in the back of her neck. Ellie was neither startled nor moved. She ran her hand through Martha's hair. There's only one person in the world with hugs like that. And in that moment, standing over the ashes of my wife's clothes, I thought myself a lucky man. Not because these two women were everything I loved of this world, but, but, but because I would have no sorrow in seeing the rest of it go to hell. I'll leave, it, I'll leave that there. I'll leave the reading there. Um, the... the, the uh, I don't know if it. I don't know if it provides any sort of illumination or, or what, I was, what I what I'm trying to do or where I'm coming from with my work. But when I when I was when I was in my early twenties and I I I'd done a lot of reading um, all over. My reading was wide and undisciplined and all over the place. And uh, part of my reading was. Um, one of my favorite readers, like all up all through my teens, was Louis L'Amour, the, the American Western writer. I read an awful lot of his work. And um, he was the first writer that 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 
ever convinced me that landscape was, was a character, uh, that it was a real presence in, in, in books. Um, there was a time in my life when I was more familiar with the, the Mojave Desert than I was with the West of Ireland. If I'd been dropped in the Mojave Desert, I think I might have found my way home. If I'd been dropped in Galway, not a chance. Um, and, um, and, and, and I knew, you know, I knew that, for instance, that you had to respect the desert, that you had to, <laughs> you had to meet it on its own terms. You couldn't get into a fight with it because it would burn you to death or it would freeze you to death or it would part you to death. But if you, if you, um, if you knew how to, if you knew how to behave in it, that it would nurture you along. Um, he was really good on that. And, and you know, I, I read two or three of his novels during the summer. I was in a secondhand bookshop in Galway and I found battered corgi editions of them. And I went back and read two of them. And um, geez, I didn't have to do too much reading to, to, to realize what it was that so enamored me of, of, of those books and that. So landscape was a kind of a big thing in both it's a big thing in solar bones. It's becoming a big thing in, in the books in, in the science fiction project. And I was, I was, um, when I was, when I was of that age as well, in my early twenties, you know, you're kind of looking around you and seeing what sort of shapes you're going to throw as, <laughs> as a man, as a person, as a, as a, as an imaginative creative being and that. And I'd read, I'd read high up and low down and I remember reading John McGahern's early books, The Dark, but principally Nightlines. And Nightlines is a genuinely shocking book to encounter in your, in your late teens. And what shocked me about it was that some of the incidents were shocking, but my life as a country lad was in it. I recognize this book. This is my life. These small farms, these little ditches, these cocks of hay, these odd people up the road. This is my life. And at the same time, I read Philip K. Dick. And I thought both of these writers were brilliant in their own way. And then I read J.G. Ballard. And I always thought like, and it, something came together in my head and I, I thought like that, <laughs> I thought that if, if those three writers met at a crossroads and conceived a love child, that, that, that I would be, that, that that was where that that's where I that's that's where I'd be. I I I professed to see that there wasn't enough Philip K. Dick in John McGahern, and there wasn't enough John McGahern in Philip K. Dick, and there wasn't enough J.G. Ballard in anyone but Ballard. So, I, for some reason or other, I kind of found by some sort of triangulation, I tried to find my way between those writers because they were they were what I admired. So so now when I start writing. All my work starts out in West Mayo, um, starts out in rural West Mayo, which is where I'm from. Um, and then it takes off from there. And I have no difficulty with clones or robots or spaceships or anything after that. Um, so that's so that's what's happening. That's what it is. That's what's happening there. The story I've read is um, the bit that I find most interesting is that it, it, it has revived a trade that has long died. Uh, Catherine, you might know, you know something about a keening and that, the, that there was a tradition of professional keening in, in, in this country. Yeah. And, and, apparently, uh, and apparently it seems to be revived in, the, in this story of mine that there is a, that there is a, a guild of keeners and, um, and she, has, uh, she has revived that trade and she faced the difficult uh, I know how the kid. I know how the kid died from another story. He was a clone, but um, keening a clone presents real difficulty, because keening is supposed to be how great and how wonderful you are as an individual human being, the mark you have left on the world. But that's kind of smudged and made a bit awkward by the fact that this kid is a clone, and um, I know why he was cloned and how he was cloned. That's the that's the stuff of another story. But I found it interesting that. A trade from the past was kind of projected into the future, was revived in the future, and that. Um, well, it's so, so interesting how you talk about these combinations of writers, um, and this being very fertile for you, that it, like it generated you as a writer, you know, and that taking like this traditional practice of professional mourning, 
and applying it to you know the kind of cutting edge of our science right now the new production of people then it raises this really interesting question in the story of what does that mean and it seems like this professional mourner is in some ways responsible for managing the energies around death and especially people who are have some kind of uncertain status in society and yeah. that it's almost like a kind of media broadcast even though it it's a voice this is really intriguing it became apparently the very first one in in the story she she's been she was mentored by the the the, the um the trade of keening was, was was minted again and it's kind of the work of a performance artist as well it's kind of a, it's an art form it's a it's a vocation it's an art form it's it's um mythopoeic all of that kind of thing and, and and it seems to take the place of of the the catholic christian rituals by which burial was and and because keeners always had this odd they always had this troubled place in in the in the um in the in, in, in the in the in the ritual of dying and, and the whole ceremony of dying. Did you know, Catherine, that there was that there's recordings right up to the 1950s of Keening in Ireland? I didn't know that yeah. until the other day. Yeah, I was going to say how surprisingly long lived it is. Um, there's a weird word to use around Keening, but that it's a very it's very strange. It survived so long in Ireland. And but I wonder if you know it's interesting because it's also a kind of version of the writer. You know, the Keener shows up and has to project themselves imaginatively into a situation and produce, yeah. kind of vocalize in yeah. a way that it represents, but also kind of draws people in, like acts as a kind of um, mouthpiece or a way for people to make sense of everything. In it a way that writers kind of, do too. Yeah, and it was, it was it, it's eulogizing as well as the, the job of the poet and, and, um, and that, and, and, and in some sense, Solar Bones is a kind of a self-eulogy, uh, a man eulogizing himself, and I don't—he wouldn't see it as you. Uh, as it's essentially a man gathering his thoughts that turned out to be a, a eulogy and a lamentation at the same time, and everything like that. But um, and and um, a couple of people have said to me, I, I don't know if you know Louis de Quer. <coughs> uh, Louis Louis has said Louis has said to me, "It's a poem. Go on, admit it." It's a poem. <laughs> and, and, and I said, "Well, well," I says he says it's a lamentation on that. Uh, but I, he's uh, he's um, he, he says it's his post mortem lamentation and that. Um, but I, I I certainly think that it's it's understood as a song, which is again back to the Keening thing. Um, uh, I, I I think it is actually a song built to span heaven and earth. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think I think that that there's a it lends itself to another understanding, possibly a deeper and more resonant understanding, if you conceive of it and think of it as a song, as a as a song that lasts yeah. for an hour and that. So yeah. all of that, that keening and lamentation and everything, those came to my head. You know, it was brought, it was it, it it was brought back to me on a on a, I was asked to give a talk up in North Mayo uh, at at a kind of a cultural conference on on. It was a thing place called Thor it was a conference called Taurus Naman uh, about a woman's journey. Uh, and and um it's set up in North Mayo because North Mayo is when in my in my mother's generation would have been for the winter months would have been denuded of men uh because they because there were migrant workers and they would have been in Britain in England and that and the land and the care of the farm and everything, the women were the men of the house. Uh, for those winter months and that in, in, in quite a lot of places. And um, so he, so it was Justin Salmon uh, uh, who organized this kind of conference. And when I went up there, then I, I heard Lilith O'Leary talking about Keening. And I was thinking, that's the thing I haven't heard in the longest time. And I think Lilith O'Leary is, is, sings a lament as well. I know he's on, this, I don't know if you, He's in Battlestar Galactica singing a, a lament. Oh. The second or third series of Battlestar Galactica. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. I mean, he's an amazing singer. He's an amazing, yeah, amazing yeah. singer. So I, a, I mean, sorry, this, 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 this is my way of talking, going, going here, there, yeah, and everywhere. It's great. It's it's great. Good. Um, I'm sorry to interject because it's so good. I just want to say for people who have tuned in and who haven't read your novel, um, they might not realize that Solar Bones is one sentence. And I think it's a sign of how skillfully you've knit together everything that it's not actually bothersome to listen to. You know, it's not challenging. It feels very natural. Uh, like the rhythms carry you along. 
everything is kind of sewn together. And so it's actually a very, it's an experimental work of fiction. However, its impact is actually emotional. It's about atmosphere and it is about this, I mean, as far as, you know, I, your idea of it connecting heaven and earth um, or some kind of afterworld in the present world is exactly the experience, the experience the reader has, I think, of being drawn along through his life and through particularly this last week of his life to the scene of his death and to this kind of burning, this burning up of the body. I mean, it's really um, powerful, but it's all couched within the mundane world. So that passage you read of the wife being sick is central to the novel because it's so concerned with the everyday and with real people. However, or and, and it shows how those ordinary people are really connected. And so the sickness she comes down with isn't food poisoning, it's this cryptosporidium, this in, an infection that, that all these people have because the public waterworks have become infected. Yeah. And so what's amazing about your writing is that you take these remote, seemingly remote, remote location of West Mayo, which is pretty remote, but you show it to be actually as connected to everywhere else as anywhere else is. And the, the single sentence, the song is really a way of doing that, of showing how the world is knit together. Yeah, I, I when, when I came to write Solar Bones, I had four books behind me. And um, and one is a, one is a, an out and out work of science fiction. It's, 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 again, it's kind of Philip K. Dick and John McGarren. Notes from a Coma is a, is a, is a, it's it's about a totalitarian experiment set in Killary Harbour and everything like that. But when I when I came to the writing of when I came to the the, the writing of Solar Bones, I, I was I was I, I probably had developed to my to my own thinking. I developed a, a reputation for kind of writing pretty chiselled, pointed, accurate sentences and that. Uh, and those are things I admired. Those are I. The, the, it was something I took from philosophy and um, the need for accuracy uh, and the need for getting to the point. But I was very conscious that that something about the messiness of life was falling outside the parameters of those sentences. And I wanted to embrace that. So how was I going to do that? Um, well, one way is write a huge book um, and, uh, you know, give you give yourself the, the give yourself a. Uh, uh, the scope of Ulysses, give yourself a George Eliot scope, something like that. But I don't have those, I don't have those reach and rhythms in me. That's not, I, I don't, I don't think I will ever have those reach and rhythms. <laughs> but I had the notion, I won't write a big book, I'll write a big sentence and see what happens. Um, and for years, for years, I'd had an exercise, for years, I'd had an exercise of, um, for years, I had an exercise starting every day that I sat down to write. I would write whatever came into my head. Um, and the only, there was only one proviso. It had to be continuous because I was interested in where it looked, it brought me. And I was, it had to, and it had, I was interested in where it brought me and the rhythm and the twisty turny notion of it. And it had to transition seamlessly from wherever it was I left off the day before. Um, so, when I came, when I realized that this character, that essentially it's a man who returns, it's a ghost who returns to his own. And, and, and that's, again, that's a piece of folklore from North Mayo, from my mom's place. They, they, when I came, to, when I came to, um, to the writing of that book and the ghost showed up on the table at that, I remembered a ghost wouldn't like full stops. A ghost <laughs> would want, you know, a ghost would balk at a full stop a ghost would seek continuance and ongoingness. And then I remembered, um, I have this, this manuscript. I had worked that exercise up to over 300 pages, um, 300 pages of nonsense, but continuous rhythmic nonsense. Whatever took me in the head, I would just continue from the day before in that. And I've never read it through actually, but there, so I so I picked it up. It, it just seemed to be, oh, okay, this is a ghost. Of course, a ghost would seek ongoingness and that. And that 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 provided the um that provided the the um the template for it and the idea for it. And you know, and yeah, I I I I thought as well, I suppose I thought as well that it was an experimental novel, but someone pulled across me there lately. Come here, he says. 
it's never a, it's never a good it's never a good thing when a fella comes up to you and goes come here he says i heard you on the radio the last night talking about writing an experimental novel he said you didn't write an experimental novel you wrote the novel the way it had to be written and that's that's exactly what i he was very right about that uh, i don't know if those are two different things you know i think that Experimental novels get a bad name because people just do it for no reason, just for the sake of trying to invent a new form, but that never works without a real motivation. I think that, I, I think that when you come to the notion of an experimental novel, you immediately roll up your sleeves because you're going to encounter inevitably something bristling and fragmented and adversarial. And um, it's, It'll probably be good for you, but it won't be comfortable. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that Solar Bones is probably, it's a bit different to that, is that you, 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 the idea, I think that what the book tries to do is to, once it settles into its rhythm, it's kind of picks you up and pulls you along with a kind of a systolic yeah. pump and rhythm and that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always think of the book, uh, Catherine has been riverine. I, I, I think of it as being, as being riverine, the late stages of a river. You know, the, you know, the, you know, in our intercert geography, where we learned about rivers in their late stage, where they were meandering and they all they almost recurve back on themselves, mm -hmm. but for eventually, mm -hmm. for all their winding and twisting, they are directional. Mm -hmm. They will always yeah. move towards the sea, yeah. and it was a, it was riverine in the late stage of riverine that I always thought of, that that I thought of that book. Mm. So like, it's amazing to hear about the genesis of this book that, you know, you kind of had the form and then you realize this is where the engineer is going to speak. This is how he's going to speak. So with your short stories, and this is taking up Alana McCarthy's question, how do you, do you have an initial concept for them or do you just start writing? How do you, what is the difference between writing a novel and writing a short story? Oh yeah, God, that, that's, a, that's a six marker. Thank you for asking. I, I set myself in a place where um, I, I, I started writing Solar Bones and very quickly into it, I, I knew that I was going to be here with this man for a while. It, he seemed to be talkative and flahul and he just had an expansive presence that I was going to be there for a while. With short stories, they come, with short stories, I, I write here, there and everywhere. And then I gather, then, you know, I gather up pieces I gather all these fragments together and I see, is there something, do these fragments talk to each other? Are they, are they, are they on about things? Are they talking to each other and everything? And some, some, some of them coalesce together and the rest have to be shoved aside because they don't belong. Um, and it's, it's kind of, I, that isn't even awful clear now to myself, even as I put it like that, but that's as good as I can, that's as good as I can put it. I, it, it it's kind of like, it's kind of all your, your receptivity, it's a different type of receptivity and uh, that every, uh, every idea that comes to me, I am going to, every idea that comes to me for the next while, I'm going to melt it down to 10 pages, 15 pages. It's like some part of you says that. Um, and and every idea that comes to you, that's what happens to it. You 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 melt it down or render it down to ten to fifteen pages in that. Uh, but for me, it's all about finding characters and people and what do they do and what are they involved in and that. And um, that's about as clear as I can make it, uh, Catherine. Mm. The one thing I do, the one thing, the one thing that I could say about them is that is, is that my short stories. I, I people write people write short stories and after two or three years they look back on all the short stories that they've written and they say oh I have a book of short stories cool and they gather them up they gather 15 of them and they throw three of them away and that and they publish a book of short stories for me actually for me is that it's, it becomes very quickly after I finished setting out on the writing of a book of short stories that they're going to gather around the theme. My, so, I, so I always say that I write collections of short stories. My first collection of short stories, getting it in the head, was about imaginative obsession. They're all about people who have, you know, there's a woman who is obsessed with eating a glass window. There's another, uh, another artist who's obsessed about his own dismemberment and that, and on and on it goes. These 
fella imagining things unto death. Forensic songs very quickly became about after forensic songs, a very nine, a post 9 11 book. And it fed into that whole forensic, popular forensic culture that dominated TVs for, for 15 years after, after 9 11. You know, about um, how do we know things? What do we know? What can we say we know now that we know this? And it became about the status of knowledge. So very quickly, 10 or 12 stories grouped around those things. What can we know? How do we know things about the, the sort of fragmented, giddy epistemologies that came after 9-11? I was, I was um, you know, there are things we know. Who was it that said that, Mr. Mr. Oh, yeah. Rumsfeld? Yeah, the man who wanted the war on the cheap, yeah. Um, um, Donald Rumsfeld. There are things we know and there are things we don't know and there are the known knowns, but there are the unknown unknowns of that. Yeah. And that became, that became a, everyone laughed at that. Sounded like just the sort of rhetorical nonsense that would come from a, that would come from, from, a, from a, a, a politician who was blathering. But actually it's, 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 uh, it's epistemologically sound and that. Um, so, so that, so a collection of short stories they tend to bundle around that, uh, and these short stories that I'm that I'm writing at the moment, they're all bundled around some future conception of the West of Ireland that I don't know what to make of it. Uh, I don't know what shape or anything it's going to make of it, and um, I'll, I'll need. I have great patience as a writer. I have, um, I have, I, I have, I have a stalker's patience. I can, I can, I, I can stick with an idea for oh ten years. You know, I, there, there are, there are. There are stories in forensic songs that are, it took me about 10 years to write in that, only 20 pages like that took me yeah. poking and prodding at them and varnishing them and, and sanding them and it took 10 years to do them. Yeah, I, so I welcome more questions on, in the chat feed um, from the audience. I kind of want to ask you while people are typing about um, Irish fiction or Irish literature and you know, the, your stories really kind of situate Ireland in the world more generally and do you think that Irish fiction has had to change or is changing because of the kind of interconnection now um, of our lives? Yeah I think that um, when you know when, when I when I was um, when I was when I published my, my first book, uh, when I got signed on and that, and I went to Dublin and I was, I went to Dublin and I found myself in literary society in, in Dublin. And I found that I had done, my reading was very different to everyone, to all of my generation. Um, my reading was science fiction writers. Thomas Pynchon was, a, was an extraordinary encounter in my early twenties. You know, my head, I thought my head would go on fire reading the opening pages of uh, V. And, um, and when I got, and when I went up to Dublin and started talking about these writers, like they were, they were, they were talking about reading Raymond Carver and, and, uh, and um, the Dirty American Realist, because that's what was happening at the time. And I, and I thought, they did that in the 19th century. You know, that's, yeah. that's not much of a, it's not much, neither, it's neither a technical nor a thematic advance on it. I was startled at, at, that my reading was so different. Um, and because of that, then, you know, I, my work had a preoccupation with, with form and with theme that was, you know, kind of, uh, I suppose, set, set my work apart a little from, from those in my generation. And now, paradoxically, I find that I'm much closer to the generation behind me than, the genera than my own generation of writers, much closer to the, to the, like, to the experimental thing that's going on in Ireland at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and they know my work. They, I was surprised actually that 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 because um, uh, you know for years I kind of had dropped off the radar. But actually, actually, you know, people like Paul Lynch were saying, "Oh no, I've known your work for years. I wonder what had happened to you," and that kind of thing. And um, so now I find myself, and it, and it was it was writers in their thirties who 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 ran with Solar Bones and who started talking about it and that. But to answer your question, um, Catherine, this is the in my, in my 25 or 30 years as a published writer, this is the most exciting time. And um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the best time to be an interesting writer. It's the best time to be experimenting. It's the best time to be, to be um, 
thematically broadening your mind out. Um, it's also the best time to be a woman writer. The, 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 uh, the best women writers in Ireland are women, but the best men writers in Ireland are women as well. Uh, <laughs> you, you can, yeah, you can, you can look at, and, I, and I'm, I can say that because the last writer I read and talked to was Elaine Feeney. And Elaine Feeney's novel, As You Were, she spoke about the desire to get a masculine thump in it. This is the, this was the, this is what, and if you, if you read her book, and if you read Lisa McInerney, and if you read uh, E.M. Reapy, you see, you see, God, there's an energy and, a, and, a, and a, an extraordinary vibrancy there that, 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 uh, that um, uh, formally or something, I don't, I don't think it actually did belong to men. Um, so I think that now is that now is is a is um, and I don't know why it is. Um, I was talking to Nicole Flattery about. I was talking to Nicole Flattery, and she said the internet is as a huge. She said has a huge influence, um, and uh, that they've all that they've grown up in a kind of a universal homogenized culture, and that and that they've that they've that they've imbibed this from the from the the intertube, and that it's all that it's all. Uh, grist to their mill and that and um, mm -hmm. but certainly now is 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 the most exciting time and in fact one of the reasons as well Catherine is there is that there's a very gifted generation of editors in Ireland grew up and who and there were editors who didn't they weren't they didn't have the bejesus frightened out of them by experiment mm -hmm. um English English editors who had dominated what, what came out of Ireland they don't get it um, they, they, um, I, I, I have a long thesis uh, that 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 I have a long thesis that English editors have been to the detriment of 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 of, of a lot of uh, to the experimental strain of Irish fiction, yeah. and it's only when you see Tram Press, Declan Mead, and and um, and Anthony Farrell and that publishing work, and 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 even even uh, even New Island. And that you see them, oh, this, they're, 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 um, there's yeah. a great jouissance and a great energy at, at the moment. Yeah, and it's fantastic to see. So, can I ask you if, you know, synthesizing a couple of questions in the feed here, do you think that this new environment has changed the kind of underlying themes? Like, so say if Irish fiction in the past was really associated with, you know, shame and dark secrets. Is it now invest, like invested in a kind of social commentary more that is of a different kind? Or um, what do you see as the kind of, uh, uh, is it about, is it now just about experimentation and this kind of proliferation of subjects or, and topics and themes that you seem to be suggesting? Yeah, it's, it's I, 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 I don't think I can, I, as you put it to me like that, I don't think you can boil it down. You know, I, I was, <laughs> That I could say that it, it's, it's that homogenous. It seems to be quite wild and unformed at the moment, and and maybe it will gather around certain. Thing. I'd be I'd, I'd be happy to see it go stone mad and feral for for <laughs> for for, for, an, for another couple, couple of years and that. And you know, I think sometimes I think I have it solved. Sometimes I think that okay, we can we can put okay, we, there's something about the robust tones of Elizabeth Reapy and Elaine Feeney and Lisa. That we can put together and that yeah that may be a recognizable strain and then i go away then and i read something like nicole flattery's books of Sh book of short stories i don't know if you've read that but yeah, if you're looking for an, an anita bruckner for for uh, for the millennial like she's just these slow deeply considered character studies mm -hmm. that are utterly compelling and that are they should bore me but they don't <laughs> um, they're so so well done um, and uh, so minutely observed and 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 yeah it, it you know it, as it just as addictive in their own way as as, as Anita Bruckner's work was um, so no I, I can't I can't put put a put a put a, a name on it or put a handle on it and that I think I think you know I think there are people who who have even been ignored because of it? I, I think Mia Gallagher's last book, *Pictures of the Lost uh, the Lost Homeland*, is a big, two-fisted account. That's like nothing. No one else has, has written anything like it in, in recent times, and that, and it deserves more attention than it got. And 
Myself and Mia glancingly met each other seven or eight years ago and that liked each other, got on very well. And then we went away and wrote two books that are almost identical without thematically, hers about an engineer as well, about the building and everything and that, and never conferred with each other or talked to each other or anything like that. <laughs> hers is 600 pages, mine is only, you know, 250 pages. <laughs> but, it's, but, it's a, but it's a book uh, really well worth, really well worth uh, reviewing, full of, full of experiment and, and, and surging energy that, that, um, that I haven't witnessed before. Yeah. So another question that's coming up here is um, back to the kind of um, process um, that you engage in. So your thoughts about like writing as a craft and this sort of conscious control of what you're doing and a particular sort of form, but also writing as play. And, you know, you talked about the voice of Marcus coming to you, the engineer, you know, that you were ready to listen. So what would you say, I mean, it's a very difficult question about the balance between the two, or does one just have to take over? You know, the, the, idea of, the idea of writing and reading as play was very, was very dear to me uh, in, in, my, in my 20s when I started writing. And it became very dear to me uh, because I, I, I really did encounter it in the work of J.G. Ballard, particularly his book of short stories called Myths of the Near Future, uh, in which he puts the short story form through so many hoops and loops and jumps and there are there are alphabets, there are, there's an alphabet, there is a tarot card story, there is um, a documentary story and that, and, and there's an essay story. And uh, I was thinking, what's well, legitimate to write like this? This is all, I can do this? This is brilliant. And, and, and I loved reading them and I thought, I'd, I'd love to be able to do that for myself. So if you look at my first collection of short stories, there are so many, almost pre-given templates out there that I, that I, I, I write my own, al there's an alphabet, there is a, a, a exhibition catalog, there is a, there is a, um, a questionnaire that I, uh, in it, um, and I, I wrote my own questionnaire before Ballard had written his one. Um, and so, that sense of the playful and playful possibility of fiction, that was really dear to me and energizing in my early 20s and that. I am no less, I am no less interested in it now. I don't, I, I, I'm no less interested in it now, but I don't seem to be quite so nimble at it anymore. I don't seem to be so willing to jump to it anymore. There's something about the, something about the progress of a short story writer. Um, do this if, if you ever have a mind to is take down the collected short stories of John McGahern and notice how his stories get longer and longer the older he gets and that and the, that they're and in, in his first collection of short story night lines I don't know there's 12 stories 10 of them clock in under 10 pages and that that was such a boost to me uh, as a young writer oh I can write a story in 10 pages brilliant because I don't have the legs for anything else so this is how it's done and then as McGahan got older his his reflexes got slower but it's his depths got deeper and then he was writing you know he wrote those brilliant short stories towards the end of his life um, everyone talks about the the, the a country funeral um, as his late masterpiece they're wrong the Creamery Manager is his late masterpiece. Creamery Manager is, is magnificent, um, bafflingly good. But they're so slow and studied. And I noticed something of that happening in my own, in my own last collection. My first collection, there's loads of stories under 10 pages. In my second collection, there's hardly any under 10 pages. And I'm thinking, is this what happens when you get to middle age that, you're, that you're, your reflexes become slower and longer or something like that? Um, that, I have a feeling I got away from the question there. Does that, does that answer any? Well, I, I mean, but it is interesting to think of sinking into a story form and yeah. the, the flow that's happening, that yeah. brings you through, which in a way I think takes up this question of writing as play, where in a different sense that like, it's the play of the words moving to coming out of you, uh, yeah. where you're not consciously controlling it. Because sometimes the, 
very formally formally inventive stories are all head like they're all mind it's all control yeah. you know it's all consciously fabricated um, yeah. something with a longer duration is actually about a voice emerging and you know it's less controlled it's very difficult to make a it's it's very difficult to make a conscious experiment to give it that heart and soul that's why you have to you know I, I, one of the things that I do when I'm writing is that I ask the piece, if you could write yourself, what shape and form would you take? It says, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I don't want to leave my fingerprints on you. Uh, what's the form that you want to take? Do you, because uh, I'm, I'm writing a novel now that has very much more sudden rhythms, much more sharper rhythms than, than, than the book I'm, than, than solar bones and that even though it's i think thematically of a piece with solar bones and that that it's another crack at the same thing um mm. and and um and i'm and i keep asking it and it's what it's what i do every time i set out on a story show me the shape you want to be show me the structure and mm. i'll obey it um mm. i don't want to be forcing you into i don't want to be pouring you into a mold or anything like that um mm. even though i have used that even though there are templates out there that I've thrown down in the past and that and used and that I, I have, for instance, you know, written a mass mass for four voices, uh, which is which is in this short story collections, but um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's a continuing, it's an ongoing adventure, Catherine. We we, we whatever yeah. whatever it is that 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 uh, whatever it is came up. I think patience is a great patience, is a great virtue uh -huh. for a writer. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, it's fantastic to hear you talk and to kind of sense the vibrancy of the contemporary novel, you know, like at a time when it's so easy to be despondent about it as a form, where, you know, you really kind of are showing us how inventive and alive and meaningful it is in, in many, many different kind of contemporary Irish generations. Yeah, I think so. Like, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I, 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 you know, we read a lot of them novels and we go, ah, oh, yeah, all right, and that kind of thing. But um, I, don't, I don't know if you've read, I don't know if you've read, 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 the, you know, I read a novel there two years ago that still lives with me. It's, uh, it's a novel by a French writer called Melis Carangal, and it's, it's called To Mend the Living. And that's a novel that, that um, I just, I almost threw it across the broom in a fit of raging um, jealousy. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, it's just brilliant. And it's about, um, it, it's about it's about a it's about a young nineteen year old surfer who 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 um, who gets uh, who gets in puts into a, a, a reversible coma and um, I won't tell you what it's about just just have a read of it it's and that's a song as well that novel is close to being a song uh, it's called Melis Karangal and Melis de Karangal and it's called Men the Living and for my money it's the best and it's technically brilliant it's te it, it's it, it's there's there are three and four hundred word sentences in that, that that make you go, oh man, this is so cool. So yeah, the novel, it, it the novel, uh, novel lives, it still lives and breathes in that. I mean, uh, you still still find yourself taken by surprise. Everyone talks about the Elena Ferrante thing and everything, and talks about the the you know the tetralogy and everything like that. Read read. Days of Abandonment, the 180 book page one, the standalone 180 page novel about a, a man in a, in a flat in Milan. He's having dinner with a wife and two kids. He suddenly gets up and he takes his jacket off the back of the chair and he walks out on them. That's the first paragraph. And from there on, you have a 180 pages of a woman going stone mad. And it is absolutely brilliant. It's really compelling, really brilliant dissection of a woman's rage and disappointment and frustration brilliant book and again took me to a place i hadn't been before so yeah it's a good time yeah, yeah there's a lot of you know there's a lot of goof written and maybe too many tired old white men you know dominating the the scene but um i was, I was amazed the other day i saw I, I saw that the the uh the the lineup for the booker prize is it tonight or tomorrow night Oh, I don't know, actually. Um, yeah, I suppose it's, yeah, any minute now. Yeah. yeah. But it looked like a crowd of kids that were, that, 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 I don't, look, look at the, look at the nominees for it and that. And they're, they're, they're incredibly young looking and that, all writers in their 30s and that. And they were all names that were new to me and everything. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I mean, it's a good promotional moment for reading. I mean, in, in a way, the what's being suggested to me by what you're saying is that the answer to the novel is not the problem. Isn't the novel itself the problem currently? It's the people that are just not reading, maybe. But once people start reading, then every, the novel is meaningful. And it is, and it's also publishers. Um, publishers weren't willing to to take a chance on on certain books. No one, you know, my book, you know, my book went to went to Tramp Press because no one else wanted it. No one else would, would go with it, and that, um, and they were. They were very good. They they thought that everything that everyone else had moaned and griped about, they said, no, 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 that's brilliant. That whole, all that domestic stuff, that's brilliant. That whole engineering stuff, that's great. The whole expert, no, no, we can go yeah. with that. Everything, it was just brilliantly counterintuitive. Yeah. And 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 they said that we we think that we think that publishing houses have made a underestimate what readers will go for on that mm -hmm. and only that can account for you see something anomalous like grief is the thing with feathers you know becoming what is it is it a novel is it a poem is it some hybrid of the two mm -hmm. and um now is the time for now is the time for those pioneering investigations uh, i suppose because there's a willingness on the part of there's certainly certainly a willingness on the part of brilliant small publishers to work with them. You see people like Tram Press, Lilliput in Dublin have always been there, have always been a brilliant publisher. Uh, Fitzcarraldo in, in, in London and that, you know, Fitzcarraldo has, has, has single-handedly rejuvenated the essay form in, in, mm. in Britain and that. They, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was something that was confined to old men with quills and and they have they have they have rejuvenated it completely in that, and done it with so much confidence. That, uh, yeah. That. yeah, yeah. Well, it's been um, inspiring and enlivening to talk with you, and I'd like to thank you again, and uh, thank everybody for showing up to um, enjoy your your writing and your your spoken words. Um, thank thanks you so much. much. Thank you very much. Best of luck. Look after yourselves and. Um, you know, stay safe. These are strange times. Bye-bye, folks. All right? Bye-bye. Thanks again. Bye.